Tuesday is election day. But overshadowing any voting next week is the countdown to election day 2016, when the ballot will include the candidates seeking to become the 45th president of the United States. So as our nation increasingly turns its attention to November 8, 2016, I would like to invite us to reflect on our fifth UU principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. In particular, I would like to explore some of the roots of our current partisan divide in this country using as our guide a book titled The Jefferson Rule, How the Founding Fathers Became Infallible and Our Politics Inflexible. It's by David Sahat, an associate professor of history at Georgia State University. And as we look to history for lessons that might inform our democracy today, one of the biggest takeaways from Sahat's book is a reminder that from the beginning, the founders were not unified in their visions, their hopes, their dreams for this country. So we should be wary of anyone who conflates the founders all together and makes claims about, oh, all of the founders said this, or all of the founders said that. The founders often disagreed profoundly, and many of those tensions remind, remain with us today. But before we plunge fully into the 18th century, allow me to make one more overall point. In general, I invite you to consider that our UU heritage should make us cautious of claims that we should do or believe something simply because the founders of our country allegedly said so. To unquestioningly follow authority figures, whether they are religious or political authorities, advocates our responsibility to use our reason to look to our own experience of ourselves and others and the world. As one of our hymns says, ours is a freedom that reveres the past but trusts the dawning future more. In contrast, I was raised in a theologically and a politically conservative context, which taught me to believe in a perfect past from which we have fallen. Perhaps some of you were told similar stories. In my childhood, this perfect past was embodied theologically in the Garden of Eden, which was thought to be a geographical locale about 6,000 years ago, and politically in a rose-colored view of our founders and founding documents. I was taught that we should struggle to return ourselves and our society to be more in alignment with this perfect past. And that, but that irrespective of what happens in the long run, God would guarantee a perfect future for those who are righteous. Today I've come to a different understanding of the past, of the present, of the future. Accordingly, these are three of at least my personal maxims. The first is that there never was a perfect past. There is no perfect past to which we can return. But still, the stories of exemplary lives and communities in the past, such as the founders of this country, can inspire us still today. Second, there is no single perfect way for every individual and community to be in this or any other present moment which means that I am a pluralist. It means that I think there is more than one legitimate way of being in the world. That does not mean that I'm a relativist who believes that every possibility is equally worthy of our time and attention. My third maxim is there is no guarantee of a perfect future. But we can nevertheless choose love. We can choose compassion. We can choose forgiveness as a way of doing what we can to increase our chances of creating a more hopeful future. So even as we learn from history, we must also consider possibilities that were not even conceivable when our nation was founded more than two centuries ago. Turning then historically to the founders of this country, much of what united them, and in, in to, to any extent that they were united, was, rally, was not rallying for a shared philosophy of government, it was rallying against Great Britain. And when that common enemy was defeated, there was infighting 
around how best to unite the original 13 colonies into the United States of America. For instance, when General George Washington became President Washington, he found that the cabinet members within his administration were significantly harder to keep united than the soldiers had been when he was Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. Consider, for example, just three cases. Alexander Hamilton, he was the first Treasury Secretary. He was a vocal advocate of a strong national government. Conversely, Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, was equally vocal for a weak national government. Moreover, Jefferson, the famed writer of that first draft of the Declaration of Independence, did not support the writing of the U.S. Constitution. He would have preferred instead to live under an amended version of the Articles of Confederation. Moreover, he was in Paris during the entire Constitutional Convention. And Jefferson wasn't the only con constitutional detractor among the founders. Edmund Randolph, one of three people who stayed through the entire um, constitutional conversation and then declined to sign the actual document, he became our first attorney general, the chief law enforcement officer of the new government. Oh, you don't want to sign the constitution? Please, become attorney general. That's a great idea. Um, suffice it to say that what Washington predicted would be the, quote, tranquil deliberations and voluntary consent that he thought would, uh, he anticipated from the leaders of the new government turned into a much more combative reality. And in ways that parallel today's legal arguments about how the Constitution should be interpreted, major controversies arose from the beginning. For instance, on the question of whether we should form a national bank and whether that was even constitutional, Jefferson and Madison and others who favored a smaller, weaker national government, they emphasized a state's rights perspective embodied in the Tenth Amendment, that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it um, to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This strict constructionist perspective sees the Constitution as like the Magna Carta, primarily a restraint on power that served as a charter for liberty. On the other side, Hamilton and his supporters of a strong national government emphasized the necessary and proper clause of Article I, Section 8, which gave Congress the implicit right to, quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for the carrying into execution of the foregoing powers. This broad constructionist approach holds that if Congress has the express power to do one thing, such as collect taxes, it has the implied power to do other things, such as chartering a bank, that were the means of exercising that express power. Both perspectives are rational interpretations of the same document that reached widely divergent conclusions. As the philosopher Alastair McIntyre wrote in the famous title to a book, it all depends on whose justice and which rationality. For at least this first skirmish, Washington ultimately sided with Hamilton, and, the, and broad constructionism won the day. But the ideological battles continue into our present day. Also fascinatingly, even though Hamilton, that great early champion of you know, a strong national government and a broad constructionism, even though he was killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson's vice president, mm. hmm, uh, Jefferson ironically ended up using Hamilton's strong government, broad constructionist interpretation of the Constitution to justify his use um, of treaty rights for the Louisiana Purchase when he was president, showing that Jefferson was in the end, in the end more of a pragmatist than an ideologue. Now there's a lot more to be said about how the founders didn't write a perfect document, such as the fact that we've amended it 27 times to date, generally making improvements each time. Remember, for example, that Jefferson was the second vice president of this country, not because he was John Adams' running mate, but because the Constitution, prior to the passage of the 12th Amendment in 1804, granted the vice presidency to the runner-up. Imagine the equivalent today it would be as if Obama's VP had been Romney and McCain in his uh, respective terms in office, or if Bush's VP had been Gore and then Kerry. <laughs> 
That, that really is the equivalent of Jefferson being Adams' as VP. But for now, in this brief journey through the history of our democratic process, allow me to skip ahead to the Civil War, which, less than a century after this country's founding, created perhaps our greatest constitutional crisis. Born out of the ongoing power struggle reflected in a strict constructionist, small government, states' rights approach to the Constitution versus a broad constructionist, strong government, federalist approach. As our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, said in the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. But looking back on the carnage of the Civil War, historian David Sahat challenges us to see that in a fundamental sense, the Founders' Union had failed. Constitutions are supposed to keep citizens from killing each other. In a constitutional democracy, citizens are supposed to solve their disagreements by voting. But Americans killed Americans on a spectacular scale in the Civil War. And in the aftermath of almost 2% of the U.S. population killing one another, the Constitution had to change. The 13th Amendment of 1865 abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment of 1868 nationalized citizenship and made the federal government into the guarantor of American rights. And the 15th Amendment of 1870 gave all men the right to vote. The total effect was a revolution of national purposes and of constitutional design. It was not simply a restoration of the Union envisioned by our founders. Accordingly, it is significant to note the increasingly realistic views toward the founders that came in ensuing decades after the Civil War that contrasts sharply with the much more idealized view of the founders here in many camps in the early 21st century. For example, our 18th president, Ulysses Grant, who had been the commanding general of the Union Army during the Civil War, said regarding the founders, we could not and should not be rigidly bound by the rules laid down under circumstances so different. It is preposterous to suppose that the people of one generation can lay down the best and only rule of government for all those who come after them. Grant recognized that when the founders first created the Constitution, they lived in an age of sail, an age of the horse. Grant's generation now used steam, the telegraph, the iron ship, and a thousand other things the founders could never have dreamed of. We today are heir to a globalized world of space travel, smartphones, and the internet. In a similar vein, our 26th president, Teddy Roosevelt, said, Our forefathers faced certain perils which we have outgrown. We now face other perils, the very existence of which was impossible that they should foresee. The problems are not new, the tasks before us different from the tasks set before our fathers. Such distancing views are not how we have heard the founders talked about in recent decades. This trajectory of disidentifying with the, founding, with the founders massively reversed course with the Reagan Revolution in the 1980s. Reagan told the story of our nation's founding as a mythologically perfect past to which we needed to return. As the Reagan campaign told the story, all the founders had supported a strict constructionist, small government, states' rights view, when that was really just one among many opinions of the founders, rep an opinion represented most famously by Thomas Jefferson. But as we have discussed, Thomas Jefferson was neither at the Constitutional Convention, nor did he want the Constitution in the first place. The founders were not of one mind and had profound ideological disagreements about the nature of government. And there have always been significant supporters among our nation's leaders, both of a strict constructionist and of a broad constructionist camps of constitutional interpretation. And as we consider this sweep of our nation's history, it is important to be honest that it is not a coincidence that a full-throated resurgence of a Jeffersonian, small government, states' rights, neo-Confederate view of U.S. history arose in the late 1970s, just about a decade after the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and it was a protest, essentially, for the victories won for equality at 
the federal level. Now, there's a, a lot more that I could say. I'm appreciative that Nancy brought me this quote to read and suggested it, that we read it for the spoken meditation about Wendell Berry. To me, Wendell Berry is a great example of a conservative in the best sense of the word. Of, and that there's, and I've said a lot previously, I'll link to some places, I can't repeat every sermon every time, but that, that in the best sense of the word, the conservative movement of this country has brought us healthy views of authority, of sanctity, of loyalty, stability, tradition. But there are ways in which that's also been manipulated, and we see that um, on both sides. And related to the shift we've been discussing in uh, U.S. culture in reaction to the civil rights movement, which is with us today, with the elevation of William Rehnquist to Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he served from 86 to 2005, we began to see a shift away from the jurisprudence that had allowed the creation of the social safety net policies of the New Deal in the 1930s. And we began to see a shift toward a strict, uh, a new form of strict constitutionalism known as constitutional originalism, which sought to find the founder's original meaning and to say that that was the only legitimate form of constitutional interpretation. But as we have seen, that quest is arguably impossible because the founders reading the same constitution that we read today did not agree amongst themselves. Related to the, um, sorry, in the words of Justice William Brennan, uh, originalism is arrogance masked as humility. Arrogance masked as humility. It pretends to be neutrally interpreting the founders, but the end result usually just advances the justice's own biases. In the full sweep of U.S. history, we can see that we are witnessing the same interpretive battles today that have been at play since the times when Secretary of, Secretary of State Jefferson and Treasury Secretary Hamilton were each trying to convince President Washington that their respective positions was the only one right true interpretation of the Constitution. And then, as now, it is unclear what the future will bring. To give one final example of history's difficult to predict twists and turns, in 1987, President Reagan's nominee to the Supreme Court was Robert Bork, who is ideologically to the right, or he died a few years ago, uh, he was ideologically to the right even of Justice Antonin Scalia. But when Bork's nomination was defeated in the Senate, um, led the, the cause of which was led by Vice President Joe Biden, it's interesting how these things play out, uh, Reagan instead nominated the moderate conservative, Anthony Kennedy. So it turns out that a Reagan nominee to the Supreme Court wrote the majority opinion on major cases advancing social justice for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. 2003's Lawrence versus Texas, 2015's Obergefell versus Hodges. Of course, Kennedy also wrote the majority opinion on a landmark case that is maybe doing more than any, anything else to support wealth inequality, which is 2010's Citizens United decision. My hope for this morning was simply to trace some of the touchstones for reflecting on the roots of our democratic process in order to explore how some of the current branches of our democracy have come to be formed. For now, near the beginning of a presidential election year, I will conclude with a quote from the author and environmental activist, Terry Tempest Williams. She's also, by the way, Mitt Romney's cousin once removed. Her grandmother and Governor Romney's father were cousins. In an essay titled Engagement, Tempest writes, the human heart is the first home of democracy. The human heart is the first home of democracy. It is where we embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings and not just our minds and offer our attention to one another, not merely our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up in our determined pursuit of a living democracy. Because democracy depends on engagement, a first-hand accounting of what one sees, what one feels, what one thinks. So may we, may we question, may we stand, may we speak, and may we act. As we continue to discern how each of us calls to, 
feel, to, to think, to act, to question in our living democracy. I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing together hymn 318, We Would Be One. 318, We Would Be One.